there's always something new from our sponsor, Text Control. They just released version 30 of their document processing library that includes new document collaboration features. Using TX Text Control, you can integrate online document editing, document signing, collaboration, and PDF processing into your ASP.NET and ASP.NET Core web applications. Whether you need to create PDF invoices, quotations, or reports, TX Text Control provides the developer libraries for all document-related tasks. Check out the new features and see their technologies in action by visiting the live demo at demos.textcontrol.com. That's demos.textcontrol.com. Hi, I'm Scott Hanselman, and it's another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today, I'm chatting with Gustavo Petsi. He's a computer science lecturer in London, and on the side, he runs an online platform for learning called Pikuma, P-I-K-U-M-A dot com. It uses retro programming to teach the fundamentals of computer science and mathematics. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm having all kinds of fun. I'm on a bit of a retro kick, so I think that this is the beginning of the retro series of Hansel Minutes podcasts until I get this out of my system. <laughs> I think you may have seen some of my silly TikToks with my new Commodore 64. Absolutely. I saw that. I was just following uh, I, one of the things that you mentioned there, which was something that blew my mind. You actually mentioned that some people used to broadcast uh, via radio. And I remember people saying like, ah, you could, like I think some Russian pirate station that could just broadcast these games and people download it via radio. I was just like, I cannot believe what a time to be alive. <laughs> it is it is so amazing. And, and I'm trying to figure out why I'm so fascinated by this. And I'm worried that this is just nostalgia for a better time. And it's just something that will be forgotten. But I mean, you're involved in the retro community. People... This feels like more than nostalgia. There's something here. This seems important. Well, yeah, of course, I agree that there are, like, if you look at my circle, people are kind of 30-something years old and et cetera. But if you look at the students that I have and people that kind of show, there is an appeal to, I think, the word is simplicity, right? If, if people are working with this super complex frameworks, abstraction on top of abstraction, and then you transpile, and then you you do an NPM install, and it's, everything is so distant from the basic moving bits of the machine, right? Everyone is working on top of a server, everyone is kind of playing a game on a PlayStation, on an Xbox, uh, but you know that there is, you know, a processor, memory, so I think there is this appeal of simplicity, right? Something as rudimentary as this retro computers, there's not much that you can overwhelm yourself. You have this machine, you have a processor, you move bits to the memory. So I think that is what gets people kind of get their, their blood pumping, right? These ideas of simplicity so they don't get overwhelmed. And that's it. Yeah. There's a, there's a comfort in that because I keep seeing resumes that say full stack developer. I'm like, well, I mean, the stack is, is so that? big now. Like, what does that really even mean? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, There is this thing that uh, I think someone mentioned the other day. They were saying that I don't think there is one person that can describe entirely the, f the function or how a whole uh, phone works nowadays, right? If you have the uh, even an iPhone, there is not just one person that understands completely how the whole flow works. And maybe you have someone that understands there's an expert on the screen and how that communicates. And there's someone that is an expert on the whole uh, boot system. But, you know, it's so complex. And it, there's a lot of cooperation between teams now. And it's very hard to isolate things and put them in this, you know, this kind of atomic things that you really understand. Yeah, even, even more, I'm realizing that even simple devices now have multiple processors. Uh, oh, absolutely. You just use the example of the iPhone. Like some of the new iPhones are actually still on when you turn them off. Mm -hmm. So there's a separate processor that's just keeping track of the location of the iPhone so that you can find it when it's <laughs> yeah. off. And that processor probably runs Minix inside. So it's just like, it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So 6502 assembly. Talk to me about what the 6502 is and why is this the processor that the world just can't seem to forget about? Ooh, that's such a good question. Um, 6502 was kind of like a a luck move, right? In a way. Is everything is about price, right? So you have all these competitors trying to uh, go. You have game consoles, you have microprocessors. You have to remember this is like the 80s, right? End of 70s, 80s. 
So everyone was trying to find the cheapest option to move bits around, have an ALU to process things. And uh, yeah, so you have all these people from Motorola, people that just, you know, they left Motorola, they started to develop these cheaper versions. And when I say that they designed the circuit, they pretty much designed by hand, right? You have all these things, these people kind of leaning over their tables and trying to hand draw the circuits by hand. So you have the 6502, which was this very cheap uh, alternative to all these other Motorola. If you have like almost like hundreds of dollars back in the day, one processor, the MOS, the the, the MOS 6502, you could buy for like $15. So it was like super, super cheap. And yeah, so by being cheap and being powerful enough to to kind of move the bits around these game consoles, the MOS, the the MOS 6502 just kind of gained space, and everyone was uh, everyone was either buying the MOS 6502 or kind of duplicating and creating their own versions of the 6502 all over the world. Uh, mm-hmm either legally or non-legally, right? There's a lot of claims. But then, yeah, so the Moz started the 6502 back in the day. Commodore bought the rights of the 6502 after a while. And then you have all these super staple machines of, you know, Commodore 64, uh, the Atari, well, first, the Atari 2600, right? The Atari VCS was one of the first ones to use the 6502 processor. Uh, Commodore 64, VIC-20, I'm not saying these things in order, but Commodore 64, VIC-20, the NES, right? The Nintendo Entertainment Systems, uh, the Tamagotchi. I can just kind of name more and more uh, players here that use the 6502 or some variant of the 6502, which, yeah, is just all over the place. So a couple of things I want to call out because I like to expand acronyms for our friends that are listening. You said ALU, uh, Arithmetic Logic Unit. That's that digital circuit that lets you do, you know, bitwise and arithmetic operations with binary numbers. And then MOS, that MOS technology was metal oxide semiconductor. And that was a company that started in the late 60s. And they introduced the 6501 and then immediately after the 6502. And there was a fight with Motorola and some folks. But what was interesting about the 6502 was that it operated at one megahertz, yep. which was amazing. But it was only like 20 bucks, 25 bucks for, yeah, yeah. for this chip. So your point about cost versus perf, it, it, it hit that sweet spot that made everybody want one. Absolutely. Yeah. One megahertz and then some other versions you bump up to 1.7. And then, you know, if you, if you kind of evolve in the whole timeline is, is 1.7, 1.9. Uh, yeah. That was, that was the, the bracket of, of processing power, the cycles that you could execute. So, yeah. So then when consumers, when folks that are listening who may not be familiar with this processor think about the systems, the consoles, the computers that changed their lives, that defined their childhood, you're looking at, like you said, Atari, Apple II, NES, C64, BBC Micro, all of these at the core, a 6502 processor, right? 6502, or again, some variant of the 6502. But if, but if you look at the instruction set, right? If you, if you, if we talk about programming that processor, the instruction set, the instructions that you send to the processor, they are very, very similar. They are 6502 based, right? You have, Mm -hmm. you have all these instructions from the 6502 family of computers. So on Hansel Minutes episode 721, folks can visit that at hanselminutes.com slash 721. I spoke with Ben Eater who is well known for making a build your 6502 from scratch. Have you ever done that that series or tried that yourself? Absolutely. I love Ben Eater's work. It's incredible. Uh, he works all with this kind of, uh, you have these breadboards and then you connect all those things together and then he traces step by step. That is brilliant work. I love his work. Yeah. Yeah. So I've made it as far as being able to have all of the LEDs in a light and watch the the bus. I bought an oscilloscope. And I can watch the edges and watch the voltage and stuff. My next step is to add the screen and actually see that. And that's as close as I've gotten to really understanding how we we took lightning, we put it in a rock, (laughs) and we made the rock think, right? Exactly. We made we made sand think. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So 6502 um, in this context is a there's a Ben Eater version of that there, which is again made with you know. Uh, and gates and NAND gates and just off the shelf 7400 series processors uh, chips rather mm-hmm. but you have classes at picuma.com that teach 6502 you picked the Atari 2600 you could have picked any console what made you pick that that console yeah that's a good question uh, i think when i was starting out i had this this idea of 
uh, filling the whole timeline of the whole all the generations of game consoles, right? So mm. I, I wanted to start uh, with the Atari 2600 because that is as kind of as, almost as low level as you can get in the sense that you have to send instructions in real time for every scan line of the monitor, right? You have to re- between scan lines, you have to change and send the bytes and the bits to modify the colors and modify what is being drawn on the CRT. So that is really, really rudimentary. Right? You have to think about the CRT display, how those things are actually being implemented, how the beam works, right? how you go from left to right, drawing things. So that was something that uh, I really liked explaining. If you, for example, if you just go and you start with the Nintendo Entertainment System, there is a little bit of an abstraction there when it comes. There is a chip that does th- all those things for you in a way, right? You, you just send information to the chip, which NES programmers call the PPU, right? The picture processing unit. And then that picture processing unit already does the magic in a way for you, right? It renders things. It sends those instructions to be rendered on the TV. And with the Atari 2600, you have to say 6502 send these bits at this particular moment in time to be displayed on the CRT display. So uh, again, it's not even about making an incredibly fun game, but it's about opening that black box, right? Things that we usually take for granted back in the 80s, right? Drawing things on the display. So that is kind of why I picked the Atari VCS, because it makes you really, kind of, it forces you to think about these things, you know? using a processor, moving bytes around, shifting things left, shifting things right to kind of draw a certain pixel on the screen. And there, I, I also thought, find that beautiful. So that is pretty much why. You, you make a really interesting point when you say things that we take for granted. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, we teach Hello World in JavaScript. It might be at the console. It might be in the, in the browser. We might show someone a Hello World and then we have them press F12 in the browser and then they feel that they're at the metal when they're really floating hundreds of levels above the hundreds metal. Hundreds of levels, hundreds of lines of operating system that are interpreting those things and you know communicating with the hardware. Yeah, there's a lot of layers and layers and layers, even in the simplest Python hello world. Yeah. Let's take a moment and thank our sponsors, Seek. Keep sensitive log data entirely within your own infrastructure using Seek. Whether you use Serialog, Nlog, or .NET's built-in logger, Seek gets you centralized search, dashboarding, and alerting, all without having to share your data with third parties. Check it out at datalust.co slash seq. That's datalust.co slash seq. So folks that are listening to this show might be getting into a code camp. They might be in a boot camp. They may be in their computer science uh, education in undergraduate, or they may have 20 or 30 years in the business. Why would someone like that in any one of those positions decide that they wanted to learn 6502 Assembler? And how would that make their lives better or make their jobs better? People think that I'm very radical when it comes to these things, and they expect me to say that everyone should learn these things and everyone must learn this. No, I, I'm going to say that no, that is not true. I'm very sober when it comes to these things. I think that there are thousands of people that I've met in my industry years that they don't actually know how these things work, and they are incredible professionals, and they are productive practitioners. They deliver. They are reliable. So I'm going to say that you definitely don't have to. In 2022, you don't have to know these things, and you don't feel for to learn all these things. But if I know my audience and if I know people from, you know, the exact sciences and computer science and people that kind of, if they have this passion about discovering things, right? There is this investigative mindset that people usually come to, to the sciences. If you if you have a soul and you kind of want to understand how these things really un- work under the hood, I feel more and more people kind of joining and going back, you know, looking at the past to understand the reason why things evolved the way that they evolved. So I think that is also one of the, sorry, why do we have, why do we have a GPU, right? I, I always give that example. Why do we evolve to have a GPU, right? It wasn't the processor enough. And then if you go back in time, you understand why these things had to be changed in the way that they were changed. So people, I think that's why they go back and they try to revisit the the evolution of technology. And I think we always have, we always gain some knowledge when we kind of poke those ideas and understand how those things work. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like I want to tell people that they should do these things. But I remember when I was learning in the uh, late 80s, they would say, before 
you get to do C or C++. We're going to make you do assembler. And it was it was literally a hoop I had to jump through. But what you're doing, and I think what I've encouraged as well, is people who have started their career at any point, whether it was SQL or JavaScript or C Sharp, to choose, to choose to go backwards, to choose to pop open the hood of their car and look at the engine and take it apart for no reason. It, it won't make you a better database programmer, but it will give you insights into, into how we got here, is what I'm hearing you say. Absolutely. Like, well, it's the same reason why you ask, why do you go to a Eric Clapton concert? Like, because I want to. It's, it's, it's good, right? I don't have to have a reason. It's not going to make me get a raise or anything. I just love to, you know, it's something that I, I'm passionate about. I just want to understand. Why do people, uh, why, again, like as ex exactly like you said, why would people choose to learn about an engine? Right? If, you, if you want to understand how those things work, then you choose to go and do an online class or you choose to go and spend some time with someone that has more experience. So I think that is the that is the, the reason why people keep going back to these things. I always give an example, right? Uh, I think 10 years ago, I had a lot of co-workers that, you know, they work in the kind of office environment. They are super successful people in tech, but they always they always like to go back to do like this in the weekend they did the woodworking classes right so they always said like oh man this is amazing i just built my this bird house and it was something so simple right but the satisfaction that these people got just to kind of learning how to to cut a piece of wood uh, glue things together make something with their hands and see uh you know be able to explain from start to finish how they did that thing and kind of hold something on their hands i think that's the kind of the same principle that you get by learning how the fundamentals work, right? Yeah, of course, you, you can have, you can raise a building and you have concrete and all these things, but there's very simple things that you can just do with your own hands and most importantly, explain from begin to end how those things work. I think that is a very valuable thing for the human being. Now, you're a computer science lecturer in your day job. Hmm. Pikuma is your, is your side thing, but you're still teaching. I'm curious how writing these courses, creating these courses has changed your own relationship with computers and with the systems that you work on every day? And has it changed the way that you lecture and teach uh, other students? Um, it has in the way that, well, I don't know if this is good or bad, but I always bring these ideas of opening the black box. Whenever first I was just giving the recipe ready for the students and just say like, look, whenever you find a situation, you just use this recipe. Uh, I found out that even at undergraduate level, people find... If you don't create a connection between that recipe and the actual context, if you don't put things into context in a way that people understand where those things are applied, uh, they will forget that very soon. Uh, and if mm. you create a historical context with something, if I'm explaining how modern computer graphics works at my at the university for someone, if I at least give them an article that links back and explains how the history evolved, that will stay with them longer. So if you create that context, if you create that relationship between the past and why things evolve, again, that is, I think, I noticed that people, they retain that information a lot longer and that kind of sticks to them. It just, um, I think it clicks. I think that is the word, right? It just clicks uh, easier if you bring the kind of past and you understand how things evolve and why those things evolve. The same way that I, I learned a lot more about mathematics when I took this history of mathematics class, right? You understand a lot more of what were the problems that people had to measure their land or when you... People that had to just optimize, you know, this this bag of corns that they had. So when you have all these things, you have to optimize things. You have to understand this system of linear equations that people very early in the day, right, way before we even <laughs> we were even here. If you understand the history and the motivation, uh, it is it's a lot easier to understand why we are using this these formulas and why we are using all these things in the first place. Yeah, the the older I'm getting and the farther along in my career I get, the more excited I am about history. Yeah. And about sharing that with the next generation, because that historical context is like, why is this a thing? I always talk about carriage return line feed yeah. and how someone in 2022 is fighting with Git because of <laughs> CRLF. And then I get to go and talk about typewriters and, you know, teletypes and, you know, sending carriage returns. I think that was the first video that I remember seeing. I think you were explaining the whole brake line and carriage return on, on Unix. I love that I mean, stuff. Because there was a reason. 
Uh, and I don't know if you heard, but Charles Petzold just released his oh, second yeah. edition of Code. Uh-huh. And I love it because I think you're seven or eight chapters in before he even starts talking about computers. Yeah, yeah. You start talking about communicating with your neighbor, right? You have to send a message to your neighbor. And that book is so good. I love that book. Well, first of all, I, I, I read the title. And I have to say that was a little bit... I thought it was like a very cliche title. I was like, ah, oh, this is just one another book that is going to be like code, you know? I just mm-hmm. thought it's going to be like this very cliche book. But then I yep. started reading his book. And it's like, oh my God, this is like amazing. It's an incredible book. Yeah. Oh yeah. I was talking to him this morning uh, because uh, his, I'm going to hope to get him on the podcast soon mm-hmm. again. He also had, came on this podcast a while back and talked about analog computers, about yep. non-digital computers and how exciting that kind of stuff is. Understanding these things, it may not help you in your day-to-day getting data out of a database, but it does increase one's kind of sense of wonder. Uh, This Commodore 64 that I'm playing with, the relationship that I'm having with this computer as I hold a pocket supercomputer and Google for stuff to help me with the Commodore 64, it's just unbelievable. And I'm trying to figure out how to get my 16-year-olds to appreciate that. But right now, it's just, oh, that's a smelly old thing. I don't really care about that. <laughs> yeah, well, to to be fair, when you open yours, it was in pretty good condition. I was actually surprised. It was surprised. pretty good. I was impressed, yeah. yeah. But you know, this whole relationship, when you when you look, I, I'm going to sound completely existential now and, and very, you know, but it's whenever I always, I have this, I'm always, I, I mean, I'm fascinated by mountains, right? I love mountains and nature and these type of things and geology because... You just feel so small if you think about, you know, the the years and the evolution and all those things that were created. Again, I th- I think I felt I feel the same thing with machines nowadays. Like this whole, it's just this monster thing that they might be small, but they are there's so much packed there. Uh, and again, going back to that idea that no, not one single person can explain the entirety of the complexity that goes into this small device. Uh, it's it's kind of nice to you know feel that 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 feeling of being small in relationship to this huge mountain and then just kind of climbing one step at a time just gives you the satisfaction of understanding, you know, just kind of getting your hands dirty with that mountain makes you feel part of that whole big thing. It's, it's, it's great. Yeah, that's a really great analogy. I'm, I'm looking right now on your pakuma.com slash courses. And after I, uh, I've only taken a couple of the first part of the 6502 assembly course, but I see that there's also two-dimensional game development and then ray casting in C. So as I go through these courses, I'm going to start to understand even better how we went from, you know, 320 by 240 pixels with 16 colors to still limited colors and still a limited screen, but now literally moving in three-dimensional space or uh, depending on how someone writes their game engine where the character doesn't move, but the space around them moves around a central person. I'm not sure how yours works. Oh, no, absolutely. So, uh, well, it, it works both ways. I have students that start with this kind of, I'm going to say high level ray casting, but it's not high level, right? But I have students that start with the whole 3D and then they decide to go down to the assembler level and then to the processor. And they really understand, right? Oh, okay, so that is how the C compiler used to work whenever we compile with that ray casting thing. And this is how, you know, this is how a linker works. And, and this is how I do how the operating system. So going from top down works, but also I have students that start at the assemble level with the Atari and then they move to a higher level and then higher level that also works well because you start, you know, in the assembler, you create a macro and then that macro becomes something that you can replace. And then you, you start using a linker and then you go to the C and it's, you know, it, it goes both ways. I have students that have been working with things like for 40 years and then it's an email and they say, I cannot believe that I have been working with these things for 40 years and I never understood how these things work. Or, and also uh, people that just develop this, they just kind of import TensorFlow for uh, STS in this Python thing. And then it, they understand like, oh, I cannot believe that this is actually how linear algebra works or, you know, this type of thing. It's always... I think I always say, like, what do you do for a living? I think what I do for a living is I get super excited about stuff. I learn them and I just get, again, too excited sharing this, my, my knowledge about things. So uh, that is kind of, I think that is how I explain what I do for, for a day job. I just get too excited. And I think my wife has to suffer for that. She she <laughs> she has to always say, like, why do you get so excited about these things? I was like, well, you're not, maybe you don't understand and that's fine. <laughs> I love that. I've actually, that's not my t- actual job, but that's definitely my, <laughs> my, my side job. Uh, I've always called myself a professional enthusiast. Yeah. 
you know, like I'm just enthusiastic and I'm like, have you heard the news? And my, <laughs> my, 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 <laughs> my, my, my wife is very much not impressed with yeah. this Commodore 64 and why it's in the garage and what it is I'm doing and why this money is being spent. But like, how can you not be excited about this? But I also acknowledge on my TikToks and my YouTubes that it's like, it'll be something else next week. Exactly. Right? exactly. Well, but that is, that is what we live for, right? That is the beauty. There's always something else to learn. I, yeah. I'm, always, I'm always very comfortable because I know that if I run out of ideas or if I hit a wall, there will be something else next week and there will be more people that will be interested in hearing me have to talk about it. So that's good. Yeah, yeah. Back to layers. One of the com- I wanted to give you a compliment and talk about this technique that you use for teaching, specifically in your ray casting engine tutorial. I thought it was really cool that the first part of the course teaches the ray casting and the math behind it and the theory using JavaScript. Yeah. And then you drop down, like you say, into C or if you choose assembler afterwards. Well, when I was going growing up or learning, I was forced to do the opposite. And I think it is a more kind of inclusive way to learn to start at the high level and go down as opposed to going down and then building up. Yeah. And not just inclusive. Let's be honest. Whenever you're learning the mathematics of raycasting, right, you don't want to get your brain distracted thinking about what is the size of the how many bits do I need for this variable, right? Is it an 8-bit variable that has to hold this number or is it 16-bit or do I need a 32-bit? So you don't want to distract, or for example, do I need to deallocate memory now or not? So if I just think, okay, this is just a mathematical, we're going to abstract this idea, we're going to think about rays, it's going to cast a ray, it's going to get a distance. So JavaScript, I'm, I cannot believe I'm saying this, but it's actually good for this type of thing, right? So uh, it just kind of uh, prevents you from distracting your brain from all these kind of hardware things that you have to think when you're programming with C. Or if you're programming for like MS-DOS, well, there's a lot of modern things that you have to distract your brain with. But yeah, I think JavaScript was a good choice because yeah, it includes, right? You start thinking about the problem, you dissect the mathematics that you have to. I, I never bypass mathematics. I think in the understanding the math of all these things are super crucial. Uh, so you go, you dissect the mathematics, and then when you see this kind of JavaScript prototype of a recasting, then I say, okay, now we got what we're doing. We understand how to do this projection, these 3D things. Now let's go to my territory and let's open a main.c and let's kind of start doing things. You know, start looking at the the actual thinking about the registers, thinking about the size of things in memory, padding. So that is, yeah, it's beautiful. I think it's work. I think it works. Now I'm I'm talking a lot about beginners and getting more beginners involved in um, computing on my on my TikTok and on my YouTube, and often like nine times out of 10, a comment is math kept me out of computers or I needed to learn math and I got stuck. And I've said publicly before that it was calculus, particularly differential equations where I hit the wall. I I hit my own personal wall. I might be able to do it now, but when I was 19, I was not there. I, I, I recognize that you're using a lot of math. You have another course, a more advanced course on 3D graphics programming where you basically write a software renderer without a GPU, no OpenGL, no DirectX. How much math are we talking about? Is this trig? Is this geometry? And because I, I want, I assume you want as well as many people to take a course like this as well and not get stuck. Yeah, so I put a lot of effort into making my courses uh, self-contained. I think that's the expression I would use. That They are self-contained in the way that I am not going to go and send you just a link that says, oh, if you want to learn how projection works, this is a YouTube video. Or if you want to learn how, you know, I, I try to, explain everything and everything is self-contained i try to if you need trigonometry i will explain the trigonometry that you need Mm. but i would say that people get too scared and i don't blame them but they get too scared with the if you look at the syllabus right of the course you understand there is a lot of trigonometry linear algebra uh, there's a lot of matrices multiplication uh, matrices transformations projection uh, sometimes calculus as well, right? If you, if I have a course on physics, uh, game physics, that you have to touch a little bit of calculus as well. But again, I think that was the main motivation. I am not going to come here and say, "Oh, I assume that everyone took calculus in college, and we are going to start from there." No, I. That is again, th- I'm trying to fill that gap, right? So if mm-hmm. even if you never took calculus in college, uh, I think you will be okay, because <laughs> there is so that was my that was my history as well. Uh, I did not enjoy mathematics that much, but when I started to put things into context in the in the context of computer science, right? If you start 
especially computer graphics. I think computer graphics is a really, really good uh, connection between math, right? So some of the math that we use and, uh, and real world ap applications. Uh, that was when everything again clicked uh, in my brain. Uh, mm -hmm. And and nowadays I just nowadays I just I was just discussing with my wife the other day. I said I cannot believe that I was so stupid that when I was a kid, people actually people actually gave me the whole day to study, and I was immature to th <laughs> to to do other things other than how I actually study those things. Right? You know, when you're a kid, you just think of something else, and you're you're worried about popularity. I don't know. There are so many things going on. Oh, you're hey, I'm ready for high school right now. Like I'm now. Too. My, Absolutely. I'm like, let's go. Absolutely. I cannot. I cannot <laughs> wait for my kid to actually go, and I can, uh, you know, use that time with my kid to learn those things again. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just it, I can again. I cannot believe that I just did not study everything I could back then. But again, uh, the whole the history is if you don't put things into context. Kids mm -hmm. are not going to remember those things. That's a great point. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think that we were. At least my my brain works like that. Sometimes I know that people uh, work in different ways, or they are just uh, used to something different. But I always have to put things into context. So that was yeah. the whole point, right? Create a project, make something like suffer a little bit coding those formulas and understanding the relationship of the numbers, right? You create a formula, and then you can see the numbers growing or mm -hmm. shrinking, and then you see things rotating, translating. I think that's a beautiful way of approaching these ideas. That's really cool. Well, in closing, I do want to give you one final compliment. I realize this has been me complimenting you the whole the whole show, but you've done a, a lot of great work here. I like that you take your time. Some of these courses are long, 18 yeah. hours, 35 hours. Mm -hmm. These are not two hour YouTubes on, you know, the absolute basics of whatever. You almost, um, the English word would be luxuriate in taking your time. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you have a 35 hour graphics programming. You don't want anyone to get lost. I assume that's because of your lecturing style. You teach a 10 week or a 12 week course. You want to make sure that all the students come along for the ride. And that's why you take your time. Yeah, I think I go against the tide sometimes, uh, when it comes to this thing, most, most things that I see out there, they are usually tailored for productivity and they just get the most out of things. And then okay, this is how you do things. This is how you get, uh, this is how you, you know, create a, a CRUD in a database and then you get people out of the door. Um, I am going against the tie because I don't want things to be fast. I just want them to be right, right? So mm -hmm. I don't want them, I don't want to have any gaps. Sometimes I think my scene is to actually over explain things, but uh, so far no one complained, but I, uh, the whole point is, I savor that moment, right? So if you are here with me and if you want to learn these things, I always say it's almost like going, you know, taking a vacation, going to this kind of quiet cabin in the woods and having fun with a friend, right? A nerd friend that just kind of ping pong ideas and then we learn how these things work. Mm -hmm. Why are you rushing, right? If you're just having fun, don't rush. Let's just savor that moment and try to make the most of it. If it is right, if it is wrong, again, it depends on the students. So far, I think I did the right call on that. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Gustavo Petsi, for chatting with me today about your online courses at picuma.com, P-I-K-U-M-A. I'll put links in the show notes. I really want to encourage folks to check these out. This is not an advertisement. This is just uh, me being a fan. Uh, I'm enjoying the Atari course, and I'm planning on taking as many of these as I can because uh, this is the kind of stuff that I want to do kind of when I retire, <laughs> when I have time. I want to take all these courses and do all this great stuff. Thanks so much for your hard work. Thank you for the time, Scott. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week.